Two professors at Columbia University, Adolph A. Burrell Jr. and Gardner C. Means, recently published a book called The Modern Corporation and Private Property. In it, they tried to sum up the concentration of wealth in the USA. These are very conservative economists came to the conclusion that out of the total of $367 billion that formed the national wealth of the USA in 1929, 200 big companies held assets amounting to $81 billion, or roughly 22%. How many persons controlled these 200 companies? Possibly no more than 2,000. An insignificant handful of people controlling over one-fifth of the wealth of a country with a population of over 120 million. The professors call it the concentration of economic power, and they point out that the concentration is proceeding at a very rapid pace. The actual extent to which the concentration of power has progressed is striking enough, they say. More striking still, however, is the pace at which it is proceeding. In 1909, the assets of 200 then largest non-banking corporations amounted only to $26 billion. By 1919, the assets of the 200 cor largest corporations had reached $43.7 billion, an increase of 68% in 10 years. In the next 10 years, from 1919 to 1929, they increased to $81.1 billion, an increase of 85%. According to a report on national wealth and income published in 1926 by the Federal Trade Commission, the richest 1% of the population of the USA owned at least 59% of the wealth. The small capitalists, 12% of the population, owned at least 31% of the wealth. The workers and working farmers and small shopkeepers, 87% of the population, own barely 10% of the national wealth. This is capitalism in its modern form. Capitalism is a system of society where the means of production, factories, mines, railroads, are in the hands of private owners called capitalists. While the labor power is a commodity which has been sold to the owners of wealth for the use of production in order that the worker may make a living, this class division into capitalists holding or controlling all the wealth and the workers owning nothing but their labor power, which they are compelled to sell for livelihood, is found to be in every place of capitalist society. Modern capitalism, however, is characterized not only by this division, but by a staggering concentration of wealth. It is the corporation that now owns that operates the industries of the USA. The small owner, the individual manufacturer, is the exception, and even he is controlled by the big corporation. The rule is the large corporation. 83% of total capital investment in the USA in 1928 was in the hands of the utility, manufacturing, and finance corporations. From 1922 to 1928 inclusive, the stockholders at American corporations received over $36.5 in cash dividends and over $7.3 in stock dividends. This is sufficient proof that your employer is no longer a free individual acting on his or her own accord. He is a member of a group, a corporation. The corporation is the actual control of businesses of the USA. What is the result? You are working for a boss. You are his hands. He uses you to make a profit. How is this profit possible at all? Because he makes you work more than is necessary for you to defray your wages. In other words, when you work, you're not only reproducing the value of your own upkeep, but you're also producing surplus value, which goes to the owner. The longer the working day, the more surplus value you produce. The quicker the pace of your work, the more surplus value you produce within a given time. The capitalist will sell the produced commodity in the market. He will sell it at a fixed price, not by himself individually, but by the corporation of which he is a part. If he can produce more cheaply than his neighbor, his profits will be larger. This is why he drives you on to work faster and faster. This is why he introduces labor-saving machinery, which results in what they call technological unemployment, which is another name for throwing out workers displaced by a machine. This is why he uses efficiency engineers and experts of every kind. He calls it industrial progress, but he doesn't think of progress at all. He thinks of profits. Every other manufacturer thinks of profits. Every other manufacturer speeds his workers even faster, introduces newer and better machines. The result is even greater number of workers being displaced, while the production capacity of the plants is enormously increased. And here we arrive at the The numbers are actually employed work grows smaller. The production capacity of the factories and plants grows bigger. The wages of the workers are being cut 
in order that the employers may get bigger profits, but together with this purchasing power, the population decreases. Mass production goes on at breakneck speed while the market shrinks. It seems inconceivable that anything like this should be carried on by reasonable human beings. Yet this is actually what's happening between 1922 and 1929. Even at the very height of industrial prosperity, this vicious decrepancy was not noticed by sober observers. There was overexpansion of the plant with no corresponding expansion of the home market due to greater exploitation and impoverishment of large masses of workers and farmers. American automobile companies had a capacity of 7.7 .7 millions per year. Production was only 4.5 millions. The steel industry had a capacity of 65 million tons of ingots and castings and produced only 56.4 million tons in 1929. Oil refineries were running about three-fourths their capacity. Bitumous coal mines had a capacity of 750 million tons, but produced in 1929 only 535 million tons. Cotton textiles only about three-fourths of their mill capacity. The wool and, and worsted industry ran at about 60% of capacity. But even that sector or that percentage of the plants which were in operation produced vastly more than the market could absorb. America was producing goods it could not sell either at home or abroad. Competition among the producing units therefore increased. Every unit was trying to produce cheaper than the other, which meant that on the one hand, greater exploitation of the workers, and on the other hand, introduction of more better machinery with greater production capacity. Wall Street at the same time was doing its bit. Wall Street is the proper name for the greatest combination of financial manipulators, and it was boosted stock prices sky high. The price of stocks is based upon the estimated earning capacity of the unit that is used to stocks. The earning capacity was declared by the advocates of Wall Street to be unlimited. Prosperity was going up and up in an unending spiral. The big sharks of the stock exchange were making billions. The volumes of trading on the New York stock exchange rose from 173 million shares in 1921 to 1,125,000,000 shares in 1929. The average price of the leading industrial stocks rose from $79 in 1921 to $366 a share in 1929. The fat boys of Wall Street were having the times of their lives. Everybody praised the glory of mass production under the modern industrial system. The structure was built on sand. The crash came. It was inevitable. Stocks tumbled down. Capitalist propagandists asserted that it was only a violent, downward readjustment. It was more than that. It was a disaster. Production, which lagged even before the crash, began to decrease more rapidly. By 1932, the steel industry was working at 15% capacity. The automobile industry decreased over 50%. Coal production decreased 55%. Freight car loadings were down 50%. The index business activity was around 50. Factory employment decreased 40%. And the total earnings of worker decreased about 60%. The lost wages in 1932 amounted to over $20 billion. We are still in the grip of the crisis and all the stunts and displays of President Roosevelt and his National Industrial Recovery Act of Acre of Little Vale. Let us now cast a critical glance at the whole situation. They call it depression. They wish to make you believe it is sheer accident, but it isn't. It is rooted in the very nature of capitalism. Think of this. While you are spreading your life out in a Ford plant or a Rockefeller mine, Big heads of business corporations were garnering the profits. When 17 million workers had been dismissed in the face hazards of miseries of unemployment, the big heads of corporations were still reaping profits. True, they complained to the, the hard times. But these hard tunes have not made a single chairman of the boards of directors of large corporations go begging in the streets for a nickel to buy a cup of coffee. The captains of industry of finance, as they call themselves, are well off, depression or no depression, whereas the wages of employed workers were cut mercilessly and the unemployed were left to shift for themselves with beggarly home relief hardly sufficient to keep a body and soul together. Big business is still prosperous while the working class is suffering the greatest hardships. Must that be? It is not the workers alone who suffer either. The small and the poorest farmers, millions of them, are not much better off. They too feel the crushing hands of big industrialists and bankers. As producers of agricultural goods they have to sell, as consumers of manufactured goods they have to buy. When they sell, they are confronted with the food trust, milk trust, and tobacco trust, which pay them a small fraction of what they charge to the ultimate consumer. When they buy, 
They're confronted with the Agricultural Machinery Trust, Automobile Trusts, the Fertilizer Trust, and all the other big corporations which they charge high prices for their goods. When they need money, they're at the mercy of the banks. When they transport their goods, they're at the mercy of the railroad magnates. In either case, they suffer. The rich farmer, himself an exploiter, can stand his ground. The small and poor farmers succumb. During the crisis, millions of farmers have sunk to the level of actual poverty and near starvation. Sturdy workers of the soil, often equipped with the best machinery and tools, living on fertile land that is capable of feeding multitudes of men, unable to feed themselves. Must that be? Under the New Deal, the prices of agricultural products have been raised, but the farmer has to pay higher prices for manufactured goods. The farmer's mortgages were guaranteed by the government, but the farmer's debts have not decreased. The richest farmers may benefit some of the provisions of the Roosevelt administration. The small and poorest farmers, millions of them on the verge of ruin, were left without actual aid. Nor is this all. We must mention, we mentioned above the engineers, the draftsmen, the chemists, and all of those scientifically trained men and women who actually managed the modern industrial establishment. They did splendid work in helping build the American industry. When the crisis came, many of them were dismayed without much ado. Those who did not know how to manage industries dismissed those who knew. Engineers who designed the 8th Avenue subway in New York were known to be selling shoelaces for a living. Architects with years of experience sleep in parks. The capitalists did not need them any longer. They were dismissed, thrown out like old rags. Dismissals became general throughout the entire educational and cultural field. Writers and artists, professors and researchmen, inventors and teachers all had to go. The plight of hundreds of thousands of intellectuals is aggravated by the fact that for years they were wont to thins of themselves as part of the ruling class. Now they are fired by the ruling class because they're no more needed for the owners of wealth. Is this an accident? It is not. It is the outcome of an insane system where wealth is owned, not by those who produce it, but by those who do not produce anything, who have amassed it out of the work of others under the protection of the law, a system where production is directed not towards satisfying human wants, but towards making profits for the owners of wealth, a system where the productive capacity increases vastly while the purchasing power of the people is being slashed through the cuts in wages and through the exploitation of working farmers by the large corporations, a system where the primary purpose of labor to satisfy the basic needs of humanity is completely lost sight in the scramble for bigger fortunes, for fatter stock exchange slices, and more ruthless cleaning out of the small fellow. Where there exists all these contradictions of capitalism, a situation like the present is inevitable. One outstanding feature of this is war. Economic rivalries are extended from home market to the world market. Economic rivalries on an international scale lead to economic wars, and economic wars lead to a clash of arms. This is a truth that cannot be denied. Even Professor Raymond Mosey, Roosevelt's former chief advisor, recently admitted this. But not many realize this is a basic law of capitalism. The War of 1914 to 1918 was nothing but the clash of two coalitions of big powers, one led by Germany and the other led by Great Britain. For the economic dom domination of the world, Great Britain was an old capitalist power with colonies all over the world. Germany was a powerful newcomer in the world of big industry and its colonial possessions were small. On the eve of 1914, capitalism was being strangled with its own frontiers by the contradictions between grass production and insufficient purchasing power, as pointed out above. World expansion had become imperative for the capitalists of every country, since there were no more free territories left on the globe for big industrial states to take possession of. The clash came. It was a clash for the redivision of the earth. The clash is now vastly more eminent than it was before 1914. Capitalism is literally choking within the borders of each state. Capitalism is seeking to dominate the markets of the world. This cannot be done peaceful means. The London Economic Conference, which is supposed to facilitate a peaceful cooperation of capitalists on the international scale, failed. The result is a sharpening of the economic warfare. This is a warfare front line as occupied by the duel between the pound and the dollar. But other rivalries are not eliminated. Like growing intensity of the struggle between the USA and Japan for the domination of the Pacific. 
Hence the increased armaments going on everywhere. Hence the frantic efforts of the Roosevelt administration to build up every Navy to treaty limits, to make every American Navy second to none, to reorganize the Army, to build naval bases, to increase military aviation. Hence the appropriation of nearly a billion dollars for the Army and Navy in the current fiscal year. Capitalism breeds war. Capitalism cannot solve its contradictions without war, but the solution of ruin. War is devastation. It destroys not only the precious human lives, but a large amount of goods. It is an orgy of destruction. The brunt of a capitalist war, however, is borne by those who work. Such wars are imperialist wars because they are waged for the purpose of dominating other countries to be used as markets, sources of raw materials and investment grounds. Where capitalism is organized by big corporations to control the markets, we have monopoly capitalism. The states that are dominating oppressed nations and driving towards war to control foreign markets are imperialist powers. This is capitalism in its modern form. This is capitalist civilization, a palace built on crushed human bones, glittering glory for a few at the price of oceans of blood and tears of many, progress running amok at every step, prosperity devouring itself and devouring untold human lives, expansion made possible by killings and maimings of huge masses of innocent people, scientific advance made to serve the purpose of destruction, securing for the non-producers, starvation for the producers, the drones in great esteem, the workers downtrodden and despised. Must that be? The communists say it must not. The communists say this huge waste of human energy and human resources, this colossal amount of human suffering, this humiliation of starving and mists of plenty, this living in Hoovervilles and Roosevelt Bergs on the dumping grounds of big cities at a time when humanity has already known how to build empire state towers, this debacle, which is worse than war and pestilence, can be avoided. Life can be made livable. Life can be made a continuous and uninterruptible stream of cultural growth. This can be achieved only by the working class arising to take over and organize society on a new basis. This basis is to be communism.